And with that, let me ask Pedro to go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to thank the Haven Center uh, for having me, Michael Apple, for uh, inviting me and for, for outdoing himself on the introduction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seidman was saying yesterday, what a great introduction. He actually did better today. So, uh, so, so you have to stay. There you go. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm, and I'm pleased so many of you were able to come uh, this afternoon. I'm going to spend my time today talking about school reform, um, changing schools, transforming schools, uh, work I've been involved in for over 25 years now that I was drawn into, uh, I would say almost accidentally. Um, in part because I felt that schools were vital institutions uh, that <laughs> had to be engaged if we were going to figure out how to address many of the pressing social and economic problems facing uh, the cities where I've worked. Uh, I'm a sociologist, and so the way I approach these topics is different from most people who are in this field. And I think first and foremost, that's because I don't see them as primarily technical. It's, I don't think there's a particular recipe for reform that just will make everything all right. I think it's far more complex than that because the challenges facing our schools almost always mirror the larger issues in our society and certainly the issues in the communities where they're located. And so understanding that relationship and understanding what schools can do to respond to those larger social issues, economic issues, whether at their local or in much even global level, um, is what makes the work interesting to me, but also very, very important. Um, as, as Michael said in the introduction, I have taken to trying to, because you know, one of the things I've tried to do throughout my career in academia is not just speak to academics, uh, but to speak to uh, broader audiences, uh, educators, uh, parents, students, uh, occasionally even policymakers if they'll listen, uh, which is why I try to uh, also engage media um, and why I've, in the particular last few years started to be much more involved in writing op-eds and, and also even doing Twitter because it uh, turns out that people follow that stuff and so getting figuring out how to put complex ideas into, how many words do we get? 140 characters has become an interesting challenge. But uh, all for the purpose of trying to influence the way we think about these, these things. The big question for me, uh, my, I think Michael's question is very important, you know, can education change society? Uh, one of the things I, I know is anytime there's a revolution, first thing they do is take over the media, second thing they do is take over the schools. So there are a lot of people who believe that by controlling the schools, the universities, we can, in fact, shape society. But I also ask this question. How come this country experiences such pervasive trouble educating children, particularly when they're poor and not white? And to me, again, that's not simply a technical issue of the ability to create schools, but I think it's a about more about the nature of inequality in our society and, and the ways in which certain groups have been marginalized. Same time, because of my work with schools, I also believe there's a lot that can be done uh, that's not being done. Um, and so I want to spend time today talking about that as well, kind of what are the possibilities for change, and particularly because I have a feeling that there are at least some educators who still work in schools in the audience today. Um, I think that work becomes especially important, uh, that we not leave people just with a critique of what's wrong. So let me start by saying what's wrong. <laughs> There's a lot that's wrong. Uh, you know, and, and I think Wisconsin uh, epitomizes it, but you know, that's true now. It's a national phenomenon, right? Which is that we pursue reform of schools as though they were fads, right? And, and every few years, the fads change. Right? Uh, small schools, phonics, uh, technology, uh, you name the fad, every few years something new is going to come to fix our schools. Um, policymakers focus on it, foundations focus on it. They're, everybody's looking for the silver bullet. By now we should have realized there is no such thing as a silver bullet in education. Uh, it's always more complicated. But there's also a problem in the way we think about it. And, and, and at a basic level, 
what I see is no alignment between the remedy and the problem. It sounds pretty basic, right? If someone were to tell you that, uh, you know, you have a hole in your roof, you say, okay, I'll fix your foundation, you say, well, foundation's okay, the roof is the problem. <laughs> But in education, you know, we will think about uh, the Gates Foundation spent over two billion dollars on small school initiatives across the country. And um, I, even as it was going on, I kept telling him, you know, what? I know lots and lots of examples of small schools that don't work. It takes more than being small to create an effective learning environment. It took them. $2.6 billion to realize. Now, if you, don't, if you mention small schools to Gates, they'll curse you out. They don't want to hear about that. They want to talk about teacher effectiveness. Because that's what they've seized upon now. New, coming up with new metrics for measuring the effectiveness of teachers, and they've been behind the state's push to evaluate teachers, teachers by student death scores. The remedies don't get at the larger issue. And I would add that a lot of times, we focus narrowly on symptoms of problems without addressing the underlying causes. Focus, for example, we say we're going to reduce dropout rates. And Arnie Duncan says, the problem is that we have dropout factories. I said, well, Arnie, who I know, the problem is bigger than that. Because for all those 5,000 high schools that you say are dropout factories, there are middle schools feeding right into them that are just as bad, and elementary schools. And if you think you can solve this problem by shutting them down, guess what? You're going to be shutting down schools all over the country and you still don't even know why they fell. I can go on and on by you know, the kind of magical thinking that characterizes policy, right? Like race to the top. Right? As though, you know, fire the principal or fire half the teachers. They can't tell you which half. <laughs> they can't tell you who's going to replace them. But we keep seizing on these things as though somehow they're going to deliver us to better schools. For the last, since No Child Behind, we've been focusing very narrowly on assessment as though testing will somehow improve schools. Um, we use testing as a weapon on schools, on children. We, we, we tell uh, the schools you're failing because of the test scores. We tell the, the teachers you're failing because of the students' test scores. Policymakers have no strategy on how to use the assessments to about what needs to be done differently. And simply telling a student that they're low is not a remedy for helping the child improve performance or to learn more. So if that's all wrong, not enough focus on teaching and learning or how to make that, can create the conditions where good teaching and learning are more likely. Um, a lot of top-down reform, you know, especially in this era of accountability. That was one of my recent tweets. You know, We have so much talk about accountability except on the people with the most power. If, um, in, right now in the state of New Jersey, Michael's home state, every major urban area is under state control, with the exception of Elizabeth. And all the schools, places like Newark, have been failing by most measures for the, as long as the state's been in control. So now it's Christie's issue. But you don't hear him talk, holding himself accountable. So it's top down, it's done to teachers, not with teachers. Um, and with very little input from the people who are closest to work. I often say that in American education policy, we're much more likely to consult with the CEO of a corporation than with an experienced educator. Those who know the least have the most say, and those who know the most have almost no say at all. In politics. We don't do that in other fields. We don't do that in medicine, we don't do that in banking for sure, but in education, the assumption is that you, because you once went to school, you too can fix them. We pay very little attention to the culture of the schools. Charles Payne, the sociologist at the University of uh, Chicago, wrote a book called So Much Reform, Why So Little Change. It goes into the high schools where Arne Duncan was in charge for many years and asked why is it that after many reforms and millions of dollars spent, schools have not improved? What does he find? A sick and dysfunctional culture. It's certainly not appropriate for learning. Culture of blame, of fear, and we continue to ignore it, despite the fact that we've known for years that if you don't change the quality of relationships, if you don't change the values, the, the, the attitudes, nothing changes, no matter how much you spend. 
And then we don't pay attention to the social needs of kids. Issues like health, nutrition, housing, all of which we know impact learning. We know that because which schools are most likely to fail? The schools with the most disadvantaged kids. Why? Because we are almost always ignoring basic needs in kids. That's not part of the strategy. It was, and when it was, incidentally, during the 1970s, in the 1970s he actually made the most progress. There's an important paper called Why Aren't We Making More Progress by two authors, Barton and Coley, and they say, well, we were making more progress in the 1970s. And that's because we didn't have a schools alone strategy. We had an anti-poverty strategy. And because we were focused on housing and health and lots of other things, reading scores improved. It had very little to do with the kind of reading strategies we used. It had everything to do with what was happening outside of school. And then lastly, we don't pay nearly enough attention to where we're actually succeeding. Right? Now, talk to uh, someone who fishes. I was going to say a fisherman, but they've got fisherwomen out there, too. Right? Where do you go to catch the fish? You go where the fish are. Right? Where do you go to learn about how schools should succeed? You go where we get success and ask why, how do we do more of what happens here? And over and over again, I visit schools, some of the most dysfunctional, <laughs> troubled schools in the country, and I will almost always find at least one teacher, if not more, who's found ways to engage kids and to get them learning. And I'm always struck by the fact that that person works in isolation. It is not a resource for the people around them. So there's a lot that's wrong. I could spend the rest of the time talking more about that. I just want to acknowledge, though, that this is part of the, the problem, right? The policies we pursue, that education uh, is political. <coughs> and, and, and so getting beyond the politics to actually do what's possible is also one of the obstacles. At the same time, the kids keep showing up. And if we don't think about what we can do despite the huge constraints created by limited funding, created by bad policies, created by poor leadership, and on and on, uh, we won't even begin to educate kids. And I think there's a lot that can be done even now. So I want to start by just affirming some of the givens. And the givens are that issues like safety and health and culture and political economy in local communities impact what happens in schools, impacts the well-being of children. And unless schools have strategies to address those issues, then invariably schools will be overwhelmed by them. Safety affects learning. And that's not just safety in school, but it's safety outside of school, increasing the safety on the internet too. There's a lot of bullying through Facebook. In addition, we know that bigger issues, global issues like immigration and, and um, plant closures, all impact schools, impact quality of life in communities. <coughs> right now, uh, with this recent wave of immigrants that have come, the unaccompanied minors, we're doing a study, getting ready to start a study on how we schools are responding to these <coughs> unaccompanied minors. Right? And uh, what we're seeing, if you follow the papers, is many schools are trying to find ways to kick them out of school. Right? Because they've learned a while ago that one way to keep your test scores up is to keep out kids that bring them down. But the fact is that immigrants continue to come into our communities and transform our schools. Because schools have always been the institution that we turn to to educate and, and to integrate the next generation of immigrants. So these are global issues. Um, we know that issues like poverty and the resources available in a community invariably impact schools, but some schools find ways to address them, or at least to mitigate some of the effects. And that's what I think we need to pay more attention to, is what we can do, despite the hardships and the disadvantages, to create schools that, if not as good as the schools serving affluent children, because I think that's an unfair comparison, at least do a good job of, of ensuring that kids get an education and are safe and are taken care of. Um, and I think there's a lot that can be done in that regard. And a lot of it comes down to this basic issue. And I say this over and over because we, uh, I direct the center at NYU and we work with schools and districts around the country. And fundamentally, what I'd say is missing in most of the schools that are troubled, that are failing, is the school has not been organized to meet the needs of the children. 
The staff does not have the skills or the resources that correspond to the needs of the children. It's not to say that they're unskilled. They just don't have the right skills. And it shows. I go to schools, high schools, where kids can't read, and I meet teachers that don't know how to teach reading. It's that basic. And I can go on and on with these examples, but I would say if we focused on that, right, instead of blaming kids, blaming parents, blaming the community, blaming teachers, which is, I would say, characterizes a lot of the communities I work in, uh, we would make far more progress. So, as I think about it on a more conceptual level, I, I want to always pay attention to the ways in which the structure of our society, the structure of local communities, shape and limit what's going on within schools. You know, it's interesting, right after Ferguson, this time started doing other stories about Ferguson, like the high rate of foreclosures in Ferguson, the high rate of unemployment in Ferguson. That has nothing to do with the shooting of Michael Brown, but in some ways sets the context for that shooting. And sets the context for the feelings of desperation in places like Ferguson. And those structural barriers are real, even if they don't necessarily appear real when you're in the school, or you don't feel them in the same ways. But again, all you have to do is look at the data. The data tells us that where poverty is concentrated, school failure is almost always present. Why? Because the context, the needs in the community are impacting the school, and schools are often overwhelmed by them. Same time, there's also a cultural set, a set of cultural factors out there that go beyond political economy. I do beliefs have to do with norms, have to do with expectations, have to do with uh, the fact that we live in a society that uh, values things like football more than whether or not kids are learning, right? Something you guys know about, you guys have a good football team, right? <laughs> I always say that if we loved our kids as much as we love football, we would get better schools. Think about um, New Orleans after Katrina. Nine months after Katrina, the Superdome was up again and the Saints were in the Super Bowl. Years later, there were still no schools in the Lower Ninth Ward. There's a little town outside of West Palm Beach called Belle Glade. It's a dirt poor, all African American town. Most people don't have indoor plumbing. It's produced more professional football players than any town in America for over 20 years. Some say it's because the grass is so high, they run fast there. I say it's because we love football. And because coaches will go anywhere to get a football player, in a trailer park, in a dirt shack, in a <laughs> housing project, it's a reflection of our priorities. And our popular culture, and what we care about, what we invest in, what we don't. And so when I think about culture, I'm not talking about the culture of the children in some narrow sense, I'm talking about the culture of America, and what we prioritize and what we don't. And how that, in turn, reinforces certain kinds of stereotypes and beliefs about children. I would say the biggest obstacle to educating children right now in this country is the belief that some children aren't worthy or simply can't learn or that their parents don't care. And if you believe that's true, then you wouldn't be troubled because you'd just say, well, look who we're working with. Look who it is. And again, that's about American culture. I often point out to people, the small Caribbean island of Barbados has a higher adult literacy rate than the United States higher adult literacy rate in the United States. And it's poor, especially right now, because the economy's terrible, but it runs the economy based on tourism, <coughs> a little bit of sugar cane, some banking. When I was there five years ago, 300 students from Barbados took the SAT. Average SAT score was over 1,200. All the kids who took it were black, all poor working class. Why is it that being poor and black in Barbados is not an obstacle to achievement high level? It's not about race, it's about something else. <coughs> it's very American. And I think that unless you travel and see other places, you don't realize how American this phenomenon is. So <clears throat> what I focus a lot on is the ways in which agency can interact with structure and culture to create possibilities. 
By agency here, I'm talking about the ability of individuals to rise beyond their circumstances because of a combination of collective action and consciousness to begin to create new possibilities. And I draw a lot on the work of people like uh, David Scott and um, of Paulo Freire, and of concrete examples where this has happened. I'm looking at my friends in the back from South Africa, and you know, I, I reminded the fact that when I visited Robben Island, right, the maximum security prison off of Cape Town, where many of the ANC leaders were held, and I was given a tour by a former ANC veteran, he kept saying, this was our university. This was our university. Now, and then he explained to, 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 to me and the others how it was possible that you could turn a maximum security prison into a university that would undermine the very government that was managing the prison. Clearly, it was never created to be a university for revolutionaries. But if you could do that under those kinds of conditions, I'm sure we could turn schools that were designed to educate people into places where they actually learn. But what we're missing is, I think, a bit of agency and even some imagination. So I want to draw on that. And, and, uh, and a lot of this I frame around capacity building, which sounds technical, but I don't think about it as technical. I think about it as adaptive. I think about it as cultural work. Cultural in the sense that a big part of what we have to do is change the way we relate, change the way teachers relate to students, the way parents relate to schools, the way communities relate to the schools. Schools are always especially important communities assets, potential assets of communities, because they're stable institutions. Banks leave, restaurants, stores leave, schools are there, not always, now especially in Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia, they're finding ways to shut those schools down too. But for the longest time, schools stayed because they had stable funding. And they also, because they were open, they had this mission to educate kids, were also places where kids could be fed and where basic needs could be met. That, to me, is an opportunity, an opportunity to do something more. And if we can figure out how to match the rest of the student needs, both the academic and the non-academic needs, we could address that alignment issue that I mentioned earlier. That is, if we could see kids beyond their deficits but also acknowledge and understand their strengths, their needs, how they learn, how, and therefore understand better how to engage them, we would design different kinds of strategies and, and approaches work differently than we do right now. That would lead us to think more creatively about what kind of resources we need to get the work done. Resources that might go well beyond the school, that exist in the larger community. And it would get us thinking more about the culture of the school and how to create a climate that's more conducive to building strong relationships and to better teaching and learning. It would also force us to recognize that we have to engage the parents because the parents always matter. The parents are always influencing their children positively or negatively. They always have an influence. And even though the data reminds us that again, despite what Angel Harris might tell us, the fact of the matter is that in many schools, parents are seen as the obstacle. We will do this in spite of the parents, not with the parents. And it shows because it tends to be the kids who are doing least well are the ones whose parents have been least engaged. So it requires a different kind of vision, a vision that um, is more holistic, more integrated, uh, and that, that thinks about the work as being uh, embedded in a community, but, and that community as being a partner in the work. Uh, some of the schools I will describe in a moment <coughs> work in very creative ways with their local communities to address very difficult problems. Problems like large numbers of kids who are homeless or who are undocumented. Problems that other schools look at and say, what can we do? And they come up with some creative answers. Because they don't just focus on what's happening in school, they're looking beyond school and thinking about life beyond school as well. 
And so that different kind of vision results in a different approach to the work. So I'll give you one example. I work with a school in the Lower East Side, PS 188. <coughs> school that is located right in the housing projects off of Houston, for those of you who know the area. High rates of substance abuse amongst many of the families and of mental illness. School stays open every night till 10 o'clock. After school programs for kids. Uh, visiting one of the schools and uh, there's a uh, a published novelist who is doing a writing workshop to students. And I asked the principal, I said, how do you get a novelist to come and run a workshop for kids? He said, well, we have a lot of unemployed novelists around, so I could get them. <laughs> but what's her theory? Her theory is that it's not good enough to teach writing. What's important is to get someone who has a passion for writing to teach writing. Because what she wants to do is expose her kids to excellence so they can aspire to excellence. She's not focused on remediation and, and teaching grammar. She's focused on developing voice in her kids and teaching them to aspire to become writers. And at nighttime, that same school is open to the parents. And there's a juice bar, and there's an internet cafe, and there are services for families because she believes the school has to function as a community center and not simply as a school. Now, it's a school under siege because they recently put a charter school in there and displaced nearly half the kids. Because the kids at the charter school come from all over, and now a resource that was vital to that particular neighborhood is being taken under the guise that it was failing by the definitions that were used under Mike Bloomberg. But in these schools, what I would say is they're asking different kinds of questions. And because they're coming with different kinds of questions, they're focused on different questions, they're approaching the work differently. They're not asking, how do we raise achievement? They're saying, how do we get kids excited about learning? Think about the difference. The teachers are focused on getting children excited about learning. So they want to be in school. The school I work with um, in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, uh, every student learns to play violin. Every student. And it's not because they think they'll become violinists. It's because they want to expose them to music, something outside of their experience. They also think that teaching violin will also teach them self-control, teach them posture, teach them how to breathe, how to, uh, to concentrate. There's a theory behind the strategy that goes beyond, again, simply doing what's going to get them higher test scores. Instead of thinking about how do we hold teachers accountable or students accountable, I think we should be focused on how to hold everybody accountable, starting with those who have the most power, governors and state legislators, superintendents. Mm -hmm. Parents and teachers and students also have to be accountable for what they do and what they bring. But right now, we use fear as a motivator, as a strategy. Fear and pressure on schools. In the uh, state of Florida, puts letter grades on schools. So you can know the quality of the school. So it's going to be an A school all the way down to an F school. Now, I would think that if the state of Florida puts an F on the school, it should be sued if it still allows them to go there. Visiting Edison High School in Miami, it's a quadruple F school. And I said, Principal, how did get to be a quadruple F? I didn't know it could go on that long. He said, Well, it'll go on again. We'll fail again next year because over 80% of these kids don't speak English. And there's no way they'll pass an exam in English because they haven't been in the country long enough. And now the state says they'll take us over. I say, you worried about being taken over? He says, not at all. Because there are too many schools just like us all over the state. He said, what's more, do you think the state of Florida would know what to do if they took us over? Do you think they're holding back on some special recipe for our children? It's a total farce. And as I mentioned yesterday, there is a different way to think about accountability in terms of mutual accountability, in terms of uh, people in authority being wow. implicated in the performance of the schools. Yeah. And that's the Canadian model, where officials from the Ministry of Education go in and say, what can we do to help? Not threatening people with their jobs. And so I would argue that if we approach the work differently, 
uh, we would also come up with different strategies to support schools. And then lastly, you know, we've been focused on this question of the achievement gap, how to close the gap. And um, I would argue the gap is, is, is not simply about test scores, it's about so many other things, right? It's about gaps in learning opportunities, it's about gaps in um, preparation, it's about gaps uh, between ability and actual performance. <laughs> Talking earlier to someone who said that kids are, don't take the test seriously, they just zip through the questions. Might be mean a lot to you. It doesn't mean anything to me. I'm fourth grade. <laughs> so how do we address these gaps? And I would say that part of what we want to do is to shift the whole framing to focus on the learning opportunities and to be very skeptical of this idea that we're going to close these gaps without doing much, much more in this country to reduce inequality than we're doing right now. Because that's ultimately what's driving it. So as I've been approaching this work, and I've been uh, doing this work now, the center I, I direct at NYU works with several school districts around the country. We get called in a lot of times to help schools that are struggling. Um, and I actually enjoy the work despite the fact that many times we don't make any progress because the adults are not ready. Right? They're not ready to do what I think it's required to uh, change the environment and to change outcomes. University of Chicago uh, Consortium on School Improvement did a study over 10 years looking at schools in Chicago. They asked the question, how come some schools got better and other schools didn't? And among those who got better, which ones had sustained improvement? And what, what, was, what did they have in common? And what the research found is they had five ingredients, what we call the essential ingredients needed for improvement. A coherent instructional guidance system. That just means that teachers aren't doing their own thing. It's actually a plan, how we're going to approach certain needs of kids. Ongoing attention to developing the skills of the staff so they are in alignment with the needs of kids. Strong parent and community ties to the school. A student-centered learning climate, really important for <coughs> student discipline <coughs> and leadership. And what the research found is that if you need all five, not four out of five, certainly not three out of five, you need all five to experience sustained improvement. Now, what's interesting about this research, it was done by John Easton, who heads, until recently, the Office of uh, Educational Research in the U.S. Department of Education. So therefore, he's appointed by Arne Duncan. So I would think that Arne Duncan might have seen the book, right, and came out. <laughs> How come that's not reflected in Race for the Top? None of that is reflected in Race for the Top or any of the other policies we've seen come out of the Obama administration under the guise of school improvement. If you use these guides, then what you start to realize that many of the schools that already are performing at higher levels have those things in place. They're doing things that allow them to get better results from kids, even from kids with, who are very disadvantaged because of the ways in which they've been organized. Right? Now I would add, they also have a strong sense of community. So teachers aren't working in isolation, they work as teams, they collaborate, they analyze work together, they plan lessons together. This school, well, I'll come back to that one in a second. This school, Bronx Academy of Business Technology, serves the most vulnerable group of kids in New York City. These are all recent immigrants with interrupted formal education. I mean, they didn't attend school regularly in their home countries. So most of them are not literate in their native language, which is Spanish. And the reason why many of them will drop out is because they're also mostly undocumented. But at this school, they have over 90% graduating each year. In a school where a third of the teachers are brand new, a third are brand new, What's the secret? Not a single lesson is delivered to a student unless it's been vetted by other teachers. They meet and plan together every day. They critique each other's lessons. Say, oh, that's not going to work. Every day, I, I sat down with a group of teachers that were doing this. It's led by a veteran teacher. And I said, this is great. This is, then one of the teachers said, well, don't all teachers do that? <laughs> no. <laughs> he looked around like, what am I doing? <laughs> You know, this is a school where, because 
over 40% of the kids are undocumented, and they're aware that many of them will not be go to, able to go to college because of it, they're really thinking about how to make sure these kids can get gainfully employed when they leave there. So hence the focus on technology. <coughs> and they start them in community college in their junior and senior year, so they're already early earning college credits without having to formally apply. The school is getting better results because of how it's organized. Because every teacher in the school is a teacher of literacy, regardless of what subject they teach. When I asked the students, What's it like? What do you like about the school? They kept telling me, it feels like family. It feels like family. It feels safe here. It feels supported here. Now, that's not something you can just impose out of school. You can't say, from now on, you've got to treat like each other like family. But they've managed to do it. And because they have, they get very different outcomes for a population that would otherwise, in other schools, be very much at risk. Schools like these are showing us that you can, in fact, devise strategies. Now, this is the school I showed a picture of yesterday. This is a 90-minute math class at Hollenbeck Middle School in East Los Angeles. And as you see, the kids are up out of their seats, and the teacher's in the back talking to me, and everybody's still on task. Back when the bell rang, the kids act like they were disturbed because <laughs> they were so engrossed in what they were doing. These kids will get to go to Garfield High School across the street. Garfield High School is where Jaime Escalante was a teacher. And those of you who know the story of Jaime Escalante know that he was that crazy Bolivian engineer who believed kids in East LA could also do advanced placement calculus. Escalante died three years ago. And uh, on the day he died was also the same day they released a study by Roland Fryer. Roland Fryer is an economist at Harvard who's been studying the use of incentives, monetary incentives, to produce higher achievement in kids. And he had money from the Broad Foundation to pay kids in D.C. and Dallas and New York and Chicago, paid them for higher test scores. And after two years of paying kids, came to the conclusion it wasn't working. Escalante got better results from kids that his colleagues initially said couldn't do advanced placement calculus, who fought it. And if you know the story, you know the first time they passed the test, they assumed they were cheating. So they sent in investigators to require the kids to be retested. And they passed again, and they continued to pass at very high rates for several years in a row. And then they sent in researchers to say, what's he doing? What's so special about his techniques? And they came from Stanford and from UCLA and Berkeley, and they all came away and said the same thing. We don't say anything special about his methods. Because they didn't understand what he called ganas teaching kids the hunger of learning, right? the desire to learn, and the ways in which he builds strong relationships so kids will work for him. Because he understood that if, he, if the kids believed in him, they would work harder. And he got them to stay on Saturdays and come late. And so at his funeral, there was this great outpouring of former students who are now professionals and holding all these very high-ranking positions. One of those students I met, she's the superintendent of Inglewood Public Schools. And she's telling me that everything you hear about Escalante was true. She said, he used to come to my soccer games. He said, he came to your soccer games? She said, that's right. He said, but not to cheer me on. He would tell me, I suck at soccer. I should go back to band. <laughs> <laughs> the researchers didn't see it. The students could describe what he did. And as they describe it, it starts to sound, wow, this should be possible in more places. But a lot of it has to do with beliefs. This teacher believes it. And the sad thing is, most of her colleagues in the school don't. Her classroom, where the kids are up out of their seat, learning together, working together, looks very different from the classroom right down the hall, where they're doing this, sitting in their seat. Well, maybe they're doing this, if not bouncing off the walls. And that's the sad thing, that we have classrooms like this, and no one's learning, or not enough learning within the school about how to do it. And what happens if you can't do it after a while, you start to think maybe something's wrong with the kids. Not the, again, the environment. So we need to look at these examples, and there are lots and lots of them. Um, I work with the school MS323. Again, we have fancy names for our schools in New York City. Uh, school in the South Bronx high-performing middle school. 
where kids are engaged in a broad array of activities, again, because like Howard Gardner has advocated, they believe at MS323 you have to expose kids to good work, to people who have a passion for what they do. So they will aspire to not just pass, but to be excellent. And schools like Eagle Academy in the South Bronx, a school for young men that was created explicitly by David Banks to counter the pull of the streets. David told me, he said, we need to create a school with, that can save young men from early death, from violence, from prison. And so he was about to create Eagle Academy. They now have five schools, including um, in New York City and one in Newark. And it's all premised on the idea of creating a prep school for young men right, that would otherwise be in reform schools or worse. First time I ran into the young men from Eagle Academy was on the subway. And uh, anybody who's ever taken the subway in New York City knows the worst time to take the subway is when school lets out. That's when it's going to be loud and hectic. And there I was, headed uptown. And I see three guys in ties. And I see one offer a seat up to a pregnant woman. So I thought at first maybe they were Mormons. Because there's often <laughs> Mormons in the area. So no, we're not Mormons. We're from Eagle Academy. And I said, well, where's your teacher? I said, well, you know how to get uptown ourselves. We do it every day. I said, well, who taught you to offer up your seat like that? They said, well, that's the Eagle way. So now I'm curious. What's the Eagle way? And I find out that their strategy for countering the pull of the streets is to create a school that keeps these young men so busy they don't have time for the streets, but also is deliberately exposing them to other kinds of activities that are usually outside of their experience, like chess and robotics and fencing. I said, fencing? I said, yep, prep schools do it, we do it too. The induction ceremony for new, for entering ninth graders is run by the 12th graders to explain what's expected of a student here. Now, when I was there, they also had the Tuskegee Airmen come in, men in their 80s, right, who had served in World War II. And the um, message being that you're capable of greatness, and there are others expecting it of you. So when you go to schools like that, and I could go on and on, you see there's a different strategy, much more than about achievement much more about why education matters, what this is really about. What's, and because of that, you see kids who become much more, take more ownership and become more invested in, as learners. Um, one of my colleagues um, at, at NYU was so impressed by what he heard happening at that school in the Bronx, he opened up his chemistry lab to young people from that school. And now we have three and four kids a, a semester coming to NYU, working as RAs in the lab, and because now they're at NYU, many of them are applying there. And don't think the only choice of Elvis Lehman College, which is around the corner. Now, this is not just happening in the places I described, which are mostly urban areas in the US. It's also happening in uh, South Africa, in the townships, in communities with far more uh, obstacles than most even the most impoverished communities in this country. This is Sapphire Road's primary school. It is um, in the townships right outside of Port Elizabeth. 40% uh, of the kids there were orphans, <coughs> parents with AIDS. Uh, this is very high levels of unemployment in the community. That's, uh, you can't see the message though, it says that their mission is to uplift and empower learners and communities by providing holistic health service. That was the health clinic that I, that I got to visit. It's staffed by largely untrained mothers. I said, um, what happens if a kid is really sick? I said, well, usually we just give them some water, rub their head, and it helps half the time. <laughs> but when it's too serious, then we, we actually have to get a nurse in. This is the principal, uh, Bruce Demons. Bruce um, was assigned to the school, and when he got there, the school was in shambles. It was uh, non-functioning. Uh, barely any windows, uh, water couldn't even be delivered to the building, uh, teachers weren't showing up because they had been paid, students were barely showing up, so he's got to figure out, what do I do? So he decides he's going to hold a, what he calls a Thanksgiving party to thank the community for their support. 
and he has food and music and people come. And they think it's a joke. They say, why are you thanking us? We're not supporting you. He said, well, I'm thanking you in advance because you're going to have to support me if we get the school back going. So they think that they get the joke. So he's talking to the people who come out. He said, well, the first thing we're going to do is stop the school from being vandalized. He said, well, we know who's been vandalized in the schools. These guys in the area. He said, I'd like to meet them. So they <coughs> call the guys over. And they say, look, we're broke, we're unemployed, so we've been um, selling the, um, the, the pipes and, and, and um, as, as um, scrap metal. He cuts a deal. He said, you can live on site in this little house that you'll build, but you have to provide security for the school. And now they provide the security for the school. They don't get paid. He has no money to pay them. But they provide security, and they are there 24 hours. He said uh, to the mothers, because not many fathers involved, he said, we've got to find ways to feed the kids. Kids come to school hungry. Look at all the land we have here. So now there's a garden on site. Half the food goes to the mothers who work it, the other half goes to the kids. Kids are being fed. Not a dime more from the Ministry of Education. You have parents who do home visits to other parents who are too sick to get their kids to school. You've got parents who are uh, cleaning bathrooms as volunteers. These parents are being trained to work and assist teachers in their classrooms. So every class we visit has four and five adults assisting teachers. I kept asking them, why do you do this? You're not getting paid. What's your motivation? They said, well, our kids are here. I bring it up because the kids have, they haven't been able to change the circumstances outside of the school. They've completely changed what's happening in the school. Now it's a thriving place where kids are happy to attend. In fact, it's bursting at the seam with attendance now. People are trying to move into that area to get there because this is a now a viable learning center. Got no more money from the ministry to do this. He didn't wait for help. I bring it up because I'm so struck by how often I go to uh, to schools in this country where people are, all I get are the complaints. Complaints about the district, complaints about the board, complaints about the policy, the complaints about the teachers, and very little of the resourcefulness I saw here in the townships. Um, when I asked Bruce, I said, well, who are you accountable to? I mean, what about the, the fact that the ministry's not paying the, uh, the teachers? He said, I'm accountable to my parents. That's what I'm accountable to. And we're going to work together to demand resources for the ministry. And they were literally protesting the ministry. It's something I've never seen principals do, lead protests with parents to demand resources for schools. Because he understands it's political in South Africa, too, and that we've got to engage with politics. So I think that part of empowering and part of, um, of tapping into the agency of kids is recognizing that there's so much our kids can do. If we demystify learning for them, if we teach them the way they learn, instead of expecting them to learn the way we teach, if we focus on their strengths and their assets rather than simply their deficits, if we provide them with access to influential role models, if we um, provide them with examples of really good work to emulate and insist that that's what they produce, I think that this idea of grit, which has gotten so much attention right, since um, Duckworth got her MacArthur Award, right, to say grit is the solution to all this. Just got to give kids grit. Not grits, but grit. <laughs> and they can't explain to you how you teach it. And what's more is it's really only about what the individual does. And they can only talk about it after they've seen it. Right? We've been writing about agency as being really different from grit. Because agency is not simply about the individual, it can also be collective, like what you see in the South by Roads. Right? Parents and communities working together to address real obstacles. And agency is also about acknowledging barriers and confronting them. Not just saying that, um, you know, um, it's up to the individual to pull herself or himself up by the bootstraps. And agency is also about achieving real, measurable, life-changing milestones, which I believe is also possible. 
I believe it not because it's a matter of faith, but because I actually see evidence of it. And again, the question I ask, why don't we do more? So I would argue, and um, I'll, I'll just share this with you. I was uh, visiting a school in Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. really um, angers me because it, it spends more money per people than any city in the United States. Um, I, I go to one school, a very troubled high school, within I, you can see the Capitol from there. And uh, meet in a room with administrators. There are 20 administrators in a school with 600 kids. 20 administrators. They have a dean of this and, a, and an administrator, an assistant principal of that. And, like, wow. and meanwhile, kids can't read. And not one of them knows how to teach reading. But they have a marching band at the school that will blow your mind. And the amazing thing about the marching band is not only can the kids play their instruments, they dance while they play their instruments. And not a one of them knew how to play instruments before they entered in the ninth grade. And I asked them, I said, if, you know how to, if someone at your school knows how to do that with them, can't you find someone who could also teach reading? And they looked at me kind of <coughs> dumbfounded. Again, I think this is about priorities, about choices, and about the way in which we engage. There are real constraints and real obstacles. I don't want to pretend that there aren't, but I also think that there are possibilities that barely get explored. I think those of us who understand the importance of this work should be exploring those possibilities. Thank you. So I, I would say first, I, I think that places like Madison do have unique challenges because you're, of the fact you're serving this affluent, very entitled population as well as a, a, a much more disadvantaged population. And figuring out how to strike a balance between the two is very difficult. I've worked with the Minority Student Achievement Network, which I think Madison's part of for several years. And I would say that it, the, the biggest obstacle in all those schools, Ann Arbor, Berkeley, Cambridge, Evanston, et cetera, is the politics of inequity. Um, but I, I would also say this, that one of the schools I talked about yesterday was Brockton High School, which is extremely diverse. And it is the largest high school in the state of Massachusetts, over 4,000 kids. And it's a high-performing school. Um, so I don't think diversity need to be this obstacle that we can't overcome. I do think, though, the work does involve getting people to some a basic agreements on what are our common interests about educating our kids. Um, and I do think it's hard. I've spent several years trying to do that work in Berkeley, um, and I think I know it's hard. Um, but I, I don't think that it's not possible. Right? I just think that um, we have to be clear about what we need to spend our time focused on, what, what's the work that we need to prioritize. And I would say that in those kinds of places, it is about our common interests. It is about trying to create a more equitable learning environment for kids. Um, but, so, so that's, that's how it is. Yeah, I think, you know, it's wonderful to hear about these schools that work. And I think that one of the things that just resonates as a story is the triumph over adversity. And listening to you, I'm really struck by how much the ed reform 
people and the school privatization advocates who are running those charter schools that are squeezing out the school you described in New York have really captured people's imagination with this very emotionally compelling right. triumph <coughs> over adversity story. And I feel like it's important to tell that story with this different point of view, but I wonder if that you have a thought about sort of, in a simple way, how you're communicating the difference between what you're advocating for and describing and that, because in some ways you just sort of resonate to that emotional story, uh -huh. you know? How is it different from this, you know, we can do better and no sure. excuses and these kids are going to succeed, you know? So if you think about Waiting for Superman, right, yeah. where they kind of took that story national, right? Um, one of the things they never talked about in the schools they featured is how much more money they spend than the other schools. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, there's a lot of things they didn't talk about. Um, it may try to make it seem like it was simply the unions that were preventing us. I mean, Brockton is heavily unionized and high performing, so they don't talk about the counterfactuals at all, right? But they don't ever talk. So um, Eva Moskowitz, who runs a chain of charter schools in New York City, has gotten a lot of acclaim, both for the high performance, but also because she's doing battle with the mayor, Bill de Blasio, who uh, came in trying to oppose her and got his butt kicked. But um, what she never acknowledges, there's a reason why she has Goldman Sachs and hedge funds on her boards, is because she gets a pipeline of money. And so she's spending considerably more per, per student than the, the public schools. I would also say you will almost never find a homeless child in those schools. You will never find an uh, undocumented child. So although those kids are largely low-income African-American Latino kids, um, Amongst kids with high needs, those with the greatest needs aren't there. Right? Um, still, I would still say we should still learn from what they're doing. One, learn what does it really cost, right? and two, what are some of the strategies they're using to get better results? I think one of the sad things about the way the charter school debate has um, unfolded is that we've lost sight of why charter schools were being promoted in the first place. They were promoted as as schools where we could. Uh, try out different things that are more difficult to, to do in highly regulated public schools and learn from them so that we can then bring them into public schools. That's not happening at all because it's it a competition between schools and uh, an unfair competition at that. So, but I, the reason why I, 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 I share these stories is because I think that um, if, you know, the, I have a lot of colleagues on the left who will say, well, until we do something about poverty and capitalism, nothing can be done. Well, that leaves us really paralyzed, right? Because it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. Right? And then uh, on, you get also others who basically will tell you the problem is the kids and their families and who they are and they're anti intellectual or genetically inferior, whatever way they want to explain it. And um, that's been out there for a long time in this country. That's been a part of our historical narrative. And, and that's got to be challenged, too, because if you don't challenge that, then it, it, there's this complacency. Well, what can we expect from that? So, but I do think it's important that even <coughs> as we look at these examples, we really unpack them to say, okay, well, what are they doing? Right? There are strategies that go with it, as well as um, these kind of adaptive changes that I, I think contribute to it. And that, to me, is a sign of what's possible. And to me, uh, without that, you know, we, I spent time studying um, school reform in Boston. Right? And we were asking very similar to the question they asked in Chicago. Um, we looked at 10 schools, all were being um, subject to the same kinds of reforms from the district. Some were getting better, others weren't. What's different about the ones where they're getting better? And we decided we would study the reforms through the students right, to see what, what, how were the kids experiencing school. And one of the things we found is that, like many schools in America, the schools, were, the, the district was using fear as the primary motivator on kids, right? the th fear of failure. Well, fear of failure for many poor kids is not a great motivator, if especially you already know a lot of failure. And what we found, we were hearing from kids about what motivates you to do well, what motivates you to be successful, it was hope to help my family, hope that through education I can improve myself. And what we were seeing is that in the schools where that was, became the basis for the work, the schools were also performing at a better level. So, so fear is powerful, but hope is powerful, too. What would you say about the role of affluent communities in all of these problems? Because I wouldn't like that anybody would think that this is the problem of the poor, right? As, 
Dr. Apple uh, pointed out many times, there is no a black problem, but there is a white problem. This is not a poor problem, but a rich problem, mm -hmm. and not a disabled problem, but an able problem as well. So how the affluent communities are part of the social responsibility and, and how this is this possible partnership that can be established to sensitize these communities about their role on ending these inequalities? Well, it's a very important question, and it's one of the reasons why I've been spending a lot of time writing about how inequality contributes to the perpetuation of these, these patterns. And, and so part of the reason why I think we do need more transparency about what success, what it takes to pay for success, is to address these huge inequities in funding that are out there. I mean, we consistently spend far more to educate affluent children than we do to educate poor children. And, um, and so we need to kind of resurface those issues. Um, we need to talk about progressive taxes. California now has adopted a, a progressive school funding scheme under uh, Jerry Brown, first <coughs> nation, first state in the country to, to actually do it, where they're actually giving more money to kids that have more high need students than, than other schools. So um, we need to draw attention to that because we need to make it clear that um, it does cost. Uh, but we also need, and that's why I brought the example of Washington, D.C., to also make clear that it's not just money. Right? It is about how money is used. It's about um, the beliefs that are driving um, the, the, and the vision that's driving the work, but certainly the inequities um, make it much, much harder. And so um, calling out uh, how and why we perpetuate those inequities, I think, is, is essential, too. So, I don't know, I'm a layperson, but I mean, I've seen two things over the last 20 years. One is the, is the you know, the Arne Duncan, right, the, the assessments and accountability and stuff like that. But the other is, and you see this as a middle class parent, this kind of really hyper competitive, you know, for your own kid, right? Success in high school and, you know, super competitive, more competitive college admissions and this and that. And I'm, I guess I'm skeptical about the commitment that middle class parents really have to the success of poor kids, just in that purely kind of competitive way. Right. I, I mean, I think you're right. I think that there's a lot about our culture, I mean, American culture writ large, right, that contributes to the inequity. Right? That is, we think we're just looking out for hours and, and you're afraid of holding on to your status or for that of your children, then you get less generous and, and less likely to see how um, what's happening on the other side of town is in your interest to care about. And that's why, you know, I, you know, I often make the point that um, of our interdependence. Right? Um, and, and I make the point that, you know, Social Security is dependent on this generation of children becoming workers to support the retirees, who are mostly older and white. Right? If nothing more than for economic interest, you've got to make sure that they're well educated, right? because we've got too many old people right, to support. Right? And we've got to keep educating people. So nothing else, even if you don't care about them, you just want to care about your retirement, right? it's in your interest. Right to make sure that they're well educated. Now, if you, so you got to figure out, you know, I'm, because I do get to speak to different audiences, and I've got to figure out sometimes how do you convince affluent people? It's in their interest to educate poor kids, and often it's on those on those economic terms, right? But um, but but people define self-interest in very narrow ways sometimes, and uh, often don't see how or why. Um, these issues impact them. So uh, it's, it's not easy, but I think that's part of the work we've got to do. What's interesting to me is that uh, if you follow a lot of the polling data, education always stays very high up there as a public concern, right? Even during wars and, and, and the economic recession, we still, people still say education is important. And I think that also there is a belief that many Americans, out there, not all, that we need to expand opportunities through education. And that's, I think, again, why engaging media and engaging that conversation about how to do that becomes important so that more people can rise beyond their narrow sense of their self-interest to think about, okay, what's good? You know, I mean, right now, is it in our national interest to lock up two million people? Well, if you think that, well, that, if that keeps me safe, then yes, right? But if you say, no, but every dollar we spend, 40% of the people we have locked up are there for non-violent drug-related offenses. They lived in Europe, they wouldn't even be in jail. They'd be in treatment somewhere. Right? 
um, and that every dollar we're spending to incarcerate is a dollar we don't have for other human needs. That starts to make sense to some people. Some people. Right, um, right now, again, in California, it's about to end their three, hopefully, this next election, their three strikes law. So I, I, my hope is that we can start, if we can change the narrative around our interest, to talk about collective interest, we can also change the way we think about other people's children. Socrates? <laughs> one. <laughs> that will be one question that I'm coming to. Okay. But uh, first, I want you to uh, ask the, uh, to comment a little bit on what uh, has been said here about if we have the culture that you said before, which is very crucial, uh, and the social structure of America, the way it is, I don't see what possibilities you have for the reform, even the type you're thinking about, unless we change that too. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a Marxist to say that we should have a social revolution, but I'm a welfare statist. <laughs> we could change that. Finland, one of the reasons why Finland has a very successful educational system is because it's a welfare state. We, are, we don't have a welfare state. Right. We could therefore democratize our democracy more on the one side. I don't know how we can change our culture, though, that you said is so crucial, unless we have something attractive about it. Right. But I want to come to another question. <laughs> that was a good one, though. The, so the Socratic question. I'm going to just say, I want to there come are a lot of other questions. So if we could keep it to one now. Well, no, the, one, the first one was not the question. <laughs> the second question is a Socratic question. OK. No, Socrates. Go. Yes. Now, you talked about improvement, school improvement, uh, education improvement, it, but what does that mean? Education. You never talked about what is good education. You never talked about what is your philosophy of good education. Unless we grapple with that, you talk about school improvement. Uh, we are going to do this, and then uh, improvement in what? In in having better results. What we need change in what is good education. And we don't have that. This is our crisis now here. We, good education for us is the education that uh, develops the skills for people to get employment. But that's not good education. Only. Good education is also which cultivates the mind and the soul to become good citizens, to develop democratic values to be good citizens. And that's our problem. We have a democracy, but we don't have democratic citizens. And that's why we have all these problems in education. What do you think about What is your idea of good education? To improve what? So to, to improve the human condition, right? No, no, to improve. What do you, what do you <laughs> understand by good education? I, th I just said, to improve the human condition. Right? What does that mean? It means everything. It means it not only to, to make it more easy for people to support themselves financially, but to also participate as citizens in a democracy. I think you, it, they, you have to have both. So, so what do we do to do that in schools? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's supposed to be a discussion here. I'm sorry about that. Michael, I mean, I'm sorry about that. This is a very crucial question. I know, I, know, I understand it, but you know, forgive me, but that one of the visions of democracy that I think you share, yes. that is un funded by Greek understandings, is in fact the full participation of as many people as possible in the deliberation. So I, I think you're raising absolutely central okay. questions. Okay, all right. <laughs> so so at, I would just say this. At the, during the seminar, we spent a lot of time talking about some of those issues. And I'm in agreement with you. And, I, and, I, and in fact, I would say that if we had as our goal that what, part of what we want to do is cultivate a sense of agency in, in our students, right? Mm -hmm. Then, then, then we are talking about an education that's not simply instrumental, but it's also um, shifting the consciousness in our students so that they are... How do we do that? What kind of curriculum do we have? I would say... It, it, to empower no the to students, that. as but, you said. But I would say that if there was more problem-posing curriculum, mm -hmm. right, that is where you're getting students to think critically about the, the challenges facing our society and the world, that's a start for getting them to not be passive learners, right? But to think differently about how we use knowledge to address these challenges we face, okay? <laughs> yes, Laura. Hi. Um, you've written about pragmatic optimism, and I'm wondering if you could talk to us about, um, I guess, 
Uh, have you thought about it in the beginning, and then how have, has it changed at all for you in the years since you've written about it? Um, yeah, it, it you know um, it, it changes all the time. I mean, sometimes I go into schools where I come away so depressed <laughs> by what's happening there, and then I go to schools where I don't expect to find optimism, and I do. Right, uh, and it's usually in the relationships that exist between people um, and the humanity being shown, um, and and that opens up possibilities. So I see it over and over again. Um, and that, again, makes me think, so to go to the question that Andres didn't pose, <laughs> which is can we make changes in society without changing society first, right? Can, that's Michael's book, right? <laughs> I would say yes, but they're small changes, not big changes. Certainly it would be better if we could get a welfare state brought in. I'm so glad we got health care now to people. So this is not in lieu of those other kinds of changes by any means, right? We need to think about, you know, how do we kind of work towards creating a more equitable and just society. But I, I would say for those of us who work in education, that is one place and uh, one arena in which to work, right? and an important one, because you're working with young people who could potentially do so much more. So that work um, in schools that I see going on in many, many different places, it gives me a reason to continue to be pragmatically optimistic. <laughs> um, going back to your saying about uh, staff needing to respond to the needs of the student. Um, so I want to say first, I grew up in the Inglewood Unified School District. <laughs> left. Inglewood, LA? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's bad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Um, <laughs> oh, left promptly. And so I'm, in, I'm coming from New York now. I work in PS188 okay. with Educational Alliance. Um, okay, with the one on the lower side? Yeah. Okay. So um, the extended day program was from our organization. And so I think one of the big critiques that I had of the work that we did uh, within our youth services had to do with our ability to um, think about uh, the larger kind of structural issues that we were dealing with students. So we focused a lot on talent development and a lot of the, the uh, actual the practice skills, you know, implementing in. Um, these school settings, and um, I went through a teacher education program. We didn't talk about uh, really structural issues. When I mean, we had like a talk about white privilege, you had to do it twice because it, it fell apart. Um, even in, in teaching in Philadelphia in a charter school, um, not much critical en engagement about that piece. And so I'm, I think a lot about teacher education and wondering if you saw, can see consistently in uh, schools throughout the nation, anywhere where teachers are. Uh, tasked with thinking about larger structural issues? Um, have you seen a teacher education program? Is this a thing? And what do you think about that aspect of uh, what teachers need to be aware of, not just teaching reading, mm -hmm. but critically engaging with uh, the world around them, right. especially since the, the majority of our teaching force is white in urban areas coming right. from Teaching America, all these other. So, what is your so I, I don't know of any programs I could point to that say they've got it right and we should just keep doing what they're doing. I, I think I go to lots of universities that I think are struggling with this stuff. I think they, they, they I see them on one end or the other. Either they're doing great critical pedagogy that provides no practical training for working in the schools, or they're only providing practical training that doesn't actually get teachers to be critically engaged with the communities that they're in. So I, I see one side or the other. and. Um, that, I, so I think there's a lot of room for improvement on, on the university's end. I think you need to do both. But I think we need to move away from believing that there's some course you could take right, that would inoculate you from bias right. and just prepare you right. to become this radical educator who can right, teach right. all the kids. I don't think such a course exists, right? I, I think... Michael huh? Michael 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 I, I do think that if, if the teacher educators were in the schools with their students and, and engaging in real conversations, real-time conversations about the challenges of teaching kids, that together we might come up with better strategies for how to do the work. Right? Like ongoing among teachers? Like That's right. So, so we've got to close that gap between the university and the school. Right? And, um, 
And, and, and that, I think, is highly problematic. You know, that, that a lot of times the people who teach the university couldn't do what they're training the teachers to do. Mm -hmm. True. Right? And, and so it's very hypothetical what they're asking to do. And that's a problem. Sure. Um, I, I, so I taught at Hollenbeck. Okay. And Roosevelt. Oh. Um, okay. But, um, I said, I thought it was, is that Roosevelt next door? Yeah, I didn't want, I didn't want to crash. Sorry. Thank but you, thank but, you, but Garfield's about six miles down the road, okay. but it's close. Right. <laughs> so, but, uh, but actually the film was actually filmed at Roosevelt. So when they filmed Sending the Liver, it was actually at Roosevelt <laughs> and not Garfield. Anyway, um, my, my, I was curious about, there were two terms that you were using consistently to describe some schools, and it was high achieving and high performing. Mm -hmm. And I was curious how you define that, like what's your metric? Uh -huh. um, is, is it Secretary Duncan's? Is it the, these schools that against the odds were able to have higher test scores as well as grades, as well as, because it's just, having taught at Roosevelt for 16 years, right. I would say in many ways that was a high achieving school based on what we had right. and based on the community efforts. But on, on other metrics, it was 10 worst, it was right. family school, it was right. marked to be, it was triple F, quadruple right. F. And so I was curious how you were defining that right. in the presentation. So that's a, a fair question because um, I, I am using them um, interchangeably, but I'm not. I don't intend to. Right? Certain schools like Brockton do meet Secretary Duncan's criteria. Right? That is, based on their test scores and graduation rates, and they're they're they are high achieving school. Right? Uh, but many of the other schools I would describe are not. Right? That their region scores are low or um, but it's still what I would describe as a high-functioning school, right? Kids are learning. There's, there's a real evidence of, of, of improvement over time, right, in terms of the kids becoming more skillful, more knowledgeable. Um, they are engaged. They're happy to be there. The teachers are happy to teach them. To me, that's a high-functioning school, even if by the, um, I don't know, by the state education department's criteria, it's not doing that well. Um, and, and that's the reason why, you know, I think we have to constantly critique those, 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 those standards that are being used um, because we're not starting from the same places either, right? Um, but, but I think it's an important conversation. I had a, um, the Secretary of Education or the Commission of Education in Texas was on a panel with her and uh, she said, you know, I'm, I'm nervous because when I leave here, I'm just speaking to the state legislature. And they told me they want, uh, they, I should promise a 0% dropout rate. I said, zero percent. She said, that's what they want. I said, well, why don't you tell me you want zero percent of the kids coming hungry? And, and when they do that, you'll make sure the zero drop out. She said, that's a good idea. I don't, you think they'll listen? I don't know about that. <laughs> but I think we, we create these standards that are, I mean, even Duncan is now saying this idea that all kids will be above average is kind of ridiculous, right? And we need to, to rethink what we, how we're judging schools and the, 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 what, by what criteria. But we still haven't figured that out, you know, uh, what's a fair an equitable way in an unequitable society by which to, to monitor and measure progress in schools. I mean, the same thing is true with that school I mentioned, South Africa. Those kids are not, if you compare the kids at the township schools to kids from the affluent white areas, they're not doing as well on state exams, but is it doing a whole lot better than it was? Absolutely. Um, so that to me is a real sign of progress that shouldn't be ignored. Thank you. I made us well, I better sit to him well. <laughs> yes. Um, a lot of these success stories that you've shared are, are very exciting, but I'm concerned that a lot of them have been built on the backs of highly charismatic individuals. Mm. Um, I'm sure that none of these uh, people have lives outside their jobs, right? These are the teachers who are, or the principals who are putting in 100 hour weeks and going to their kids' uh, sporting events and calling. Uh, parents all all hours of the day and weekend coming in uh, uh, and evenings um, and Jaime Escalante for example is a, is a good example of this right um, and you described how when they went to investigate his his success that they found his teaching methods were nothing particularly innovative pretty normal uh, the differentiation was that ability to instill the ganas and the kids, right? That desire to learn, that desire to work hard, that desire to achieve. Um, so are these models something that we can replicate in other schools without these extraordinary individuals, these charismatic individuals? And if not, how do we instill this sense of ganas 
in teachers and principals around the country on a mass scale? So I would say um, it's not, the examples I presented are largely not driven by the charismatic principal. Right? Brockton High School, for example, principal who I know well, Sue Satchewitz, retired three years ago, and she's the first one to tell you the work is owned by the teachers, and if that's the reason why the school continues to make its progress. Um, and I, I'd say that's true in several of these other examples. However, I do think they are extra, extraordinary educators in those schools um, who are demonstrating a lot of commitment um, to their work. But I would also say that um, it, it does take a, a certain amount of passion to work under these difficult conditions and get better results. You can't do it, you know, by coasting, right? You've got to, you do it. But what I see is that when the educators work hard together, as opposed to just by themselves, they achieve so much more. Um, I'm always struck by the fact that most of the educators I meet, when you ask, why did you go into the profession? They don't say it's for the money, you know? They say <laughs> it was to have an impact, to make a difference. They, they asked, those were the ideals that were motivating them, and, but they often get burnt out and lose sight of those. And the schools that are making a difference find ways to continue to feed those beliefs in teachers, that they can. And, and I think that success breeds success, right? That is, you, you see good work, and then you're more motivated to do good work, right? And so are the kids. So, um, I mean, so I understand your concern that we're, you know, we have this image out there of the dangerous minds teacher, right, who comes in and is a savior, and, and because of her, her, and they all dance at the end. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I don't think it's that. I think it's, 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 it is about a, 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 a sense of solidarity with the children, the community, and among the teachers that makes it possible. Um, but it, I do think it takes hard work, too. <laughs> Just following up on that question, it seems like of all the examples you gave and the details, the one key element is like if the teachers in a school are working together and have each other's back and are constantly in each other and reinforce the message of each other, that above all other things, given all the constraints, is what makes a, you know, transforms a school. So any teacher here today can walk away from this talk, like how do you prove your school and your situation? It seems like get together with your fellow teachers. That's right. And like work to start working together, start working meeting together, start creating. You know, seems like that would that be fair to say that's their Absolutely. key Absolutely. So you know, one of the things I didn't mention, but I will mention now: Henshaw Middle School in Modesto, California. All the kids, low-income immigrant kids, Spanish-spoken at home, blue ribbon school, right? So that means it meets the state's criteria. Going back to your point of of success. So I go there, and they're taking me around, and they're explaining to me what they do. So I think, you know, I'm just, I go to enough schools, I'm suspicious. I say, I'd like to see a new teacher at work. So they take me to a new teacher's classroom, and right away I can see, okay, this person is shaky, you know, not as smooth as some of the others I've seen. And uh, he approaches me afterwards, he said, look, you know, as you can see, I'm still a beginner. He said, but I, I got to tell you, I'm doing so well here. And it's hard to see that. He said, because everyone helps me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not by myself. People are constantly coming up, offering me the assistance. Um, I get to watch other teachers and learn from He says, it's hard for me to imagine I could fail here. Mm -hmm. So that, the school I mentioned in the Bronx, third of the teachers are brand new. They're planning lessons together. They're not doing it by themselves. They don't take brand new teachers and give them the most challenging kids to teach. Right? So it, it is a lot about building community, about collaboration, about organization that is what's making it, driving it, not the heroic teacher. There's time for just one more question. Uh, Pedro's worked very hard today, so, so uh, just want one more, please. Hi, everyone. Um, so I went to a school in California from the Bay Area um, where we had a math department that was recognized in research for having very successful programs. It was called Railside. Oaks in 2008 was citing it as one of these schools that didn't track, and even though it was an urban school that served a majority of uh, uh, black and brown students, it did amazing that by the time students got to their fourth year, they were like half of them were taking AP calculus. Um, and they had, a, you know, the teachers worked really well with each other, um, and it was this, this environment that was very safe. But um, with the change with No Child Left Behind, the department was dismantled, even though it took more than 15 years to, to build and to develop. Which leads me to my question. Um, so have you, in the examples of, of schools that you studied and researched, are there, are there certain characteristics 
Um, or are there schools that have long-term been able to stay successful? Or like, um, were there things outside of the teachers, the principals themselves, that insulated these schools from facing these higher pressures? So there are. I mean, Brockton is a, is a case of, a, of, a, of a, again, the largest school in the state that's experienced sustained success, but, but also incrementally better and better. Right? It's been their path over the last 14 years. Um, and there, there are others like that where I've seen sustained uh, improvement. And then, then, but then I've also seen schools that were doing extremely well, lost some key people, and went back the other way, right? Um, so I do think it's fragile, right? It is about having the right combination of people working together. Um, so what was the second part of the question? Like, is there factors outside, like, the teachers and principals that insulate these So, you know, I, I spent... Um, four years working in Newark, and we were trying to do a strategy um, within the central ward of Newark to work with seven schools in a feeder pattern. Uh, they all went to Central High School. And, um, and we, our whole strategy was bringing in community resources to assist schools and, and helping the, 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 the educators work around school culture and engaging kids. And we actually were making huge progress, particularly Central High School. Right? Uh, and then a new um, Superintendent came in and start, did away with everything right, that we had done. And it made me realize I had um, made a fatal flaw in, 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 in how to approach the work. And that was, um, w when we first started the work, we were invited in by the former governor, John Corzai, to, to go into Newark. And then we had a different commissioner. Once the politics changed, we were, we, if we had done a better job of building strong community support, we might have been able to fight the superintendents. Because um, think about this, I mean, these superintendents, a lot of times they're not from this place, they have no long-term commitment to these places, right? But they'll come in and act like the world began when they arrived and um, undo even things that are working um, because it's not theirs, right? Which is what happened. And so, it, it, to me, it, it speaks to why it's so important to give communities more ownership. Now, the parents mobilized to demand that what we were doing continue. But she, because she's in a situation where she only uh, reports to the governor, she could basically ignore the parents. In fact, she doesn't even go to school board meetings anymore. Um, and so, it's, it's a politically toxic situation, but it undid four years of work. Um, and so I, I, I think that continues to be a, a real problem. The politics of this, right, how do you make it sustain stuff that's working past, uh, so it's not determined by a few key leaders that can undo it, remains a question I d haven't really figured out myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. There was another task that I laid out, which was the ability to speak at multiple registers. So what you said can be understood clearly at academic levels and at the levels of daily life. You now have fun. <laughs> and the Haven Center will be posting a video of this on our website tonight. So if you want to share this with your colleagues and friends, we'll be up there by the end of the night tonight. Thank you.